In the name of storytelling, Saturday, November 23rd, 2013, is hereby proclaimed to be Telebration, the worldwide event of storytelling. At this very moment, across six continents in 40 states and nine countries, from Sacramento to Savannah, Boise to Barcelona, West Virginia to West Indies, Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon, over 300 audiences are gathered for this spectacular storytelling event. Without further delay, in joy and anticipation, let the stories begin. It's now my pleasure to introduce Will Horniak, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. We don't have to have celebration in Antarctica because we have brought Antarctica here tonight. So maybe next year. Thank you for coming out on this cold night. And I know soon uh, Elizabeth will, will warm this room up in no time. This is a fiery storyteller, but also a person of amazing uh, compassion and kindness. She is tough as nails and as sweet as they come. And I know that for a fact. Elizabeth was one of the first storytellers I heard. I knew her through listening to a cassette tape. Remember those? <laughs> Long ago. And I loved your story so much that I would listen. I'd go in my room, and I'd shut the room, and I'd shut the doors, and I'd just sit there, and I'd listen to her stories, and I would laugh, and I would weep. And it was one of my first introductions at how powerful storytelling could actually be. So it was great when I met you face to face and knew some of your tales. But I wanted to say that uh, as well as being uh, one of the most popular and recognized and sought after storytellers in all of the United States for many, many festivals, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, she was also recognized by the National Storytelling Network who uh, honored her with their circle of excellence. It's very rare, it's highly esteemed. And so uh, among many, many storytellers like myself and many others, Elizabeth Ellert Ellis is considered the gold standard. And, uh, and that is not hyperbole in, in any, although I have been hyperbolic at times, you know that. Um, Elizabeth hails from um, Appalachia. Did I get it right? Did I get it right? Okay. East Tennessee country. Although she lives in Dallas now, she says that she's an economic refugee in Dallas, which is the only reason why anybody would live in Dallas. She loves Texans except when they go to the polls, that she, she said. But one thing that I recognize about Elizabeth is that uh, she has known hard times. She has known incredible difficulty. She's known challenges in her life, and she's known some really tough places. And from that, she has rendered stories that are as sweet, as beautiful as the wild roses that grow up in the mountains, and they also have a kick like moonshine. She is a fine craftsperson of tellers. She is a superb teacher of storytellers, and she provided an excellent workshop for us today. Uh -uh. And she also is a woman that likes to cut to the chase. <laughs> Elizabeth Ellis, let's welcome her. Thank you very much, and thank you, Will, for those really kind words. I'm going to try really hard not to turn this microphone over, okay? But it's sort of... I will try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming out. I want to thank the Portland Guild for letting us be together tonight. I went to college not the way other people do. Most people go away to college to newfound freedom. 
The place I went to college was even stricter than my mother was. And that's saying something. At the college I attended, we had an 18-inch rule. For the uninitiated, that means 18 inches from your shoulder to his shoulder at all times. And the dean of women had a yardstick. <laughs> that was suspended every Saturday night, but only in the parlor of the women's dormitory. In the parlor of the women's dormitory, from 10 o'clock to 11, which was curfew, you could actually sit on a boy's lap, as long as he had a magazine on his lap. <laughs> as I remember, Reader's Digest was very popular. Imagine my surprise when a guy I had met in the drama club brought his tray and came and sat down across the table from me. He was a senior. I was a lowly freshman. We talked for a while about drama and finally he got around to saying, would you like to go with me to Christmas in the Clouds? Christmas in the Clouds was the highlight of the social season. Oh, there was no dancing allowed on campus. But it was a dance without dancing. <laughs> Remember the 18-inch rule? Okay. All the trappings of a winter formal with no dancing allowed. Of course I wanted to go. Of course I wanted to go to Christmas in the Clouds. I wanted to go to Christmas in the Clouds with him. He was a senior. I was a freshman. Enough said. <laughs> I went straight back to my room and I wrote my mother a letter. I told her that I had been invited to go to Christmas in the Clouds and that I was going to need a dress to wear and to make sure that the check she might send for the dress was hefty. I included the information that my date was studying to be a minister because I knew that would mean a lot to her. <laughs> zeros. I could see them. Zeros. I mailed the letter off and it wasn't any time. Less than a week I got a letter back from my mother. But there wasn't a check in it. There was a letter, and in the letter she said she was so happy to hear I was having a good time at college. And that she'd already started making my dress for Christmas in the clouds. Oh, joy. <laughs> I wore a path to the post office, waiting for that dress. And when it came... I couldn't bear it. I didn't take it back to my dorm room. I sat down on the bench outside the post office and ripped into it. It was worse than I had imagined. <laughs> it was red and white check gingham. Imagine how I felt. It had a neckline up to here. It had leg of mutton sleeves down to here. For the uninitiated, a leg of mutton sleeve makes you look like you have the shoulders of a linebacker. Okay. It hung to my toes. It was trimmed in white eyelet. That's the insult to injury part. <laughs> I carried it back to my room. I was in absolute distress. And my roommate 
look, one look at it, and she said, you can't wear that to Christmas in the clouds. I said, you're right. I guess I won't go. I'll tell him I've taken sick or something. And she said, well, I brought two formals to college. I wore both of them in high school. And you could wear one of them. Angel, child sent straight from heaven. I could wear one of your formals. I already knew she'd brought two formals because one day when she was out of the room, I'd seen a piece of tool sticking out from the door and I'd gone prowling. I'd opened her closet door and looked. One of those formals was white. It had small silver leaves sewn all over the satin bodice and on the satin overskirt, and it ended in yards of tulle. The other was dark green velvet. A velvet top and a dark green velvet grain skirt that hung all the way to the floor. It was strapless. She said, I don't care which one you choose. I'll wear the other one. It's all the same to me. I could hardly make my mouth make the words, I want to wear the green one. <laughs> Sue Ellen had brought two strapless formals to school. She had only brought one strapless bra. I had a problem. I had to find a way to make enough money to buy that garment. I took care of the Dean of Women's incontinent dog for an entire week while she was gone to a conference. <laughs> I babysat the math professor's ten, twin 10-year-olds, that's hard to say, twin 10-year-old boys, Genghis Khan and Vladimir the Impaler, <laughs> for an entire weekend while their parents went on a romantic excursion to the Smoky Mountains. Finally, I had enough money together to get what I needed. I went out in front of the college and caught the bus into the city. I went to King's department store and got on the elevator and got off on the floor where the elevator operator, shall I say that again? where the elevator operator said, third floor, ladies' lingerie. She said that right out in public. <laughs> ladies' lingerie. I sure my mother would not approve of anyone saying that in public place. This very nice sales lady bustled up to me, and she asked me what I wanted, and I said, I needed a strapless bra. And she said, What? I need a strapless bra, she said. Stella, this girl needs a strapless bra. <laughs> and Stella came up to me and said that I would need a fitting. And I said, I don't know you that well. <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing. But finally, I got fitted, and they gave me a very pretty pink tote bag with the needed garment inside it. And I went out and caught the bus back to school. Except that about halfway to school, a lady was trying to get off with a toddler and a baby and a whole bunch of Christmas packages. And so I jumped up out of the back seat and ran up toward her to help her get everything off, especially the stroller, because she was really having trouble with that. And then, Instead of going back to the back seat to sit down, since I was getting off at the next place it stopped, I just sat down near the back door. I was in my dorm room talking to Sue Ellen about going to King's department store when I remembered that pink bag on the back seat of the bus. I called the bus company. I called several times. Nobody ever turned in that pink bag. The 
strapless bra was gone. Word of a tragedy of that magnitude spreads through a girl's dorm like wildfire. The following day, a girl from the third floor that I'd never even met yet knocked on my door and told me that she had two strapless bras because her mother believed in sundresses. I said, my mother doesn't. She said I could borrow one of her strapless bras, and by then I didn't even care if it fit. On the day of Christmas in the clouds, I got dressed early. I wanted to make sure I looked just right. I thought I looked really good in Sue Ellen's green dress. And when they called up the stairs from the parlor to tell me that I had a gentleman caller, I swear to God that's what they said, a gentleman caller, I came down the stairs feeling somewhat like Scarlett O'Hara. Jack had bought me flowers. A corsage, well, it didn't exactly look like a corsage. It looked more like what they hung around Citation's neck when he won the Kentucky Derby. (laughs) But I figured that if he had spent that much money, that meant he really liked me. And I helped him pin it on the front of the dress and toss the rest of it down my back. I thought it looked very nice. Red carnations, lots of them. And arm in arm, we walked up the hill to the cafeteria, and the cafeteria looked just as good as the decorating committee could make the dining hall look for Christmas in the clouds. There was musical entertainment. There were recitations. Every time Jack Gardner spoke to me, I turned my head to hear what he had to say and tried to make some witty remark in response. There's only one thing on earth I'm allergic to. Carnations. Every time I turned my head to speak to him, I began to sneeze. I sneezed and I sneezed and I sneezed and I sneezed. I sneezed until he Ask me if I was feeling all right, and was I coming down with a cold, and I sneezed some more. And he spoke to me again, and I turned my head to hear what he had said, and to say something witty in response, and I saw that there had been a great change in the look on his face, and that he was no longer looking at my face, he was looking at the front of my dress, and I looked down. And the underwing in the strapless bra had worked its way loose and was sticking up the top of the dress like a pair of demented bug antenna. <laughs> I'd never been so humiliated in my entire life. I jumped up and ran out of Christmas in the clouds. I ran all the way down the hill and up two flights of stairs and threw myself on the bed and started to cry. That's a lie. (laughs) I started crying before I left Christmas in the clouds. I lay there in my abject humiliation, weeping through those paper-thin walls. Whoever designs dormitories must have Japanese blood and think that paper walls are really appropriate because you can hear every sound from the room across the way. I had a sweet maid. Her name was Leslie. And Leslie had been given the big honor of being the narrator for the Christmas cantata that was happening the next day. And she must have been having trouble with her lines because she kept repeating the same thing over and over again. And it came to pass. 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 I thought, Leslie, you need to stop that. You're getting on my last nerve. And it came to pass. 
and it came to pass. Leslie, if you don't stop, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hold your head in the toilet. And it came to pass. I thought I really might go over there and kill her. <laughs> I'm laying here in my misery. And she's repeating that same line over and over again. And I'm about to go over there and do her bodily harm. <coughs> And it came to pass. After a while, a little bit of what that could mean began to sink into me. I sat up on my bed and it came to pass. I looked back toward the door. All the snow that I had tracked into our room on the hem of Sue Ellen's green dress was beginning to melt. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. I got up, took off Sue Ellen's green dress, hung it up so it could dry. I put on that red and white check gingham dress my mother had made for me with the neckline up to here in the leg of mutton sleeves and walked back up to Christmas in the clouds. Sat down next to Jack Gardner at our table. He didn't even mention that I'd been gone. He was cool. Well, you're a quiet bunch, I'll say that for you. <laughs> Up in the mountains, there lived the widow Baker. Widow Baker had been widowed for many, many years. She had the reputation for being the best cook in the whole area. When they had a church picnic, people lined up for a piece of her fried chicken, and she could make a peach cobbler that would make a mean man say grace. <laughs> to keep body and soul together, she did a little weaving that she sold to people. And so she kept some sheep. And one of the things that she and I have in common, aside from being able to make a peach cobbler that would make a mean man say grace, is that we lived in gated communities. I grew up in a gated community. If you didn't close the gate, the cows would get out. <laughs> she lived in a gated community. She forgot to close the gate one day, and it wasn't the cows, it was the sheep that got out. And she was really worried about them, afraid something would happen to them. Stray dog might get after them, maybe a wolf. They might fall and get hurt. She was going down the road looking for her sheep. She walked right in front of the farm that belonged to Old Man Williams. And Old Man Williams, although he was old, he was really a hard worker. And he had the reputation for growing the finest vegetables in the entire area. And he had been plowing that day. And he was proud of what he had done at his age to get all that done in one day. That was really good stuff. And as she walked by, she called out to him and asked him whether or not he'd seen her sheep. Well, he was really hard of hearing because he was getting old. and He thought that she asked him about the work that he'd done that day. And so he pointed very proudly to all that he had plowed that day. She thought he was, was pointing in the direction that her sheep had gone because she was really hard of hearing by that time too. And she said... Thank you for noticing where my sheep went, and when I find them, I will give you one of them as a reward. 
And she went in search of her sheep, and just over the brow of the hill, she found them all there, and she was really pleased. And then she noticed that one of the lambs had a wounded leg. And as she walked along carrying the lamb, she's thinking to herself that old man Williams, he had the reputation for being a very kind person. And besides, if this lamb was all by itself instead of with the other sheep, it would have less likelihood of getting hurt worse. She would give this lamb to old man Williams as his reward. And she had made up her mind that's what she's going to do when she came by his house. And she called out to him. He was sitting on the porch. Now, his wife had been dead for many, many years. And like I said, he was truly hard of hearing. But he heard her calling to him from the road. And he walked out there to see what she wanted. And she presented the lamb to him. And he saw right off that the lamb's leg was hurt. And he thought that she was accusing him of having hurt the lamb. And he said, no, I didn't do that. I would never do that. I would never hurt an animal in my whole life. But all she heard was no, because she was hard of hearing, you know. And she said, well, I think that a lamb is a perfectly reasonable reward. All you did is point the direction that the sheep went in. And she tried to give him the lamb again, and yet he kept trying to refuse it. No, I didn't hurt it. I would never, ever do a thing like that. She said, you should be ashamed of yourself. What a greedy man you are trying to get a bigger reward than that when you really didn't do that much to start with. Well, they started to argue. Him telling her he wouldn't take the lamb, her insisting that he take it. Neither one of them could understand a word the other one said. What was it like the last time you got in an argument? Did you lower your voice? I didn't think so. Things just kept getting louder and louder and louder. After a while, they were saying the most foolish things to one another that you could imagine. And the deputy sheriff drove by. And when he heard all that hullabaloo, he stopped to hear what was going on. And Neither one of them would pay any attention to him because they couldn't understand what he was saying. So no matter how many times he said he was taking them away to jail, if they didn't hush, they just kept on arguing louder and louder and louder until he put them in the back seat of the car. He took them into town, and they went right up before the judge. Now the judge, he was an old man. He had a reputation for being the fairest judge they had ever had in that county. And there was a reason. He was so blind that he couldn't see whether or not the people who came to court were dressed in their work clothes and their bib overalls or whether or not they were dressed in really fancy store-bought clothes. And since he couldn't be influenced by what people looked like, that made him a really fair judge. And since he was really hard of hearing, he couldn't hear the enormous lies that people were telling on the witness stand or the awful humbug stuff that the lawyers were saying. That made him a fairer judge even more than being blind, almost blind. And he kept peering at the two of them. And peering at the two of them, and after a while, he figured out that the people in front of him were a man and a woman. And it appeared to him that the woman was holding something in her arms that kept wiggling and trying to get down. And he'd been a judge a long time. And he knew that one of the main things that men and women come to court over is to get a divorce. And he thought that's why they were there and that what they were arguing about was which one of them could get to keep the child. <laughs> and so he said, how many years have you been married? And the old woman, all the widow Baker understood was how many. And she thought he was asking about her sheep. She said, nearly 30. And the judge said, you have been married nearly 30 years and you still haven't figured out a way to live in peace together. You should be ashamed of yourselves. I want you to go home and be kind to one another and live peacefully as husband and wife and make a good home for that little one there. And if you don't do that, I must throw both of you in jail. Case dismissed and away he went. Well, they hadn't understood a word he said. 
But the Debbie Sheriff explained it all to them. You have to go home, he said, and live together in peace as husband and wife. And the widow baker said, we're not married. And the deputy sheriff said, you better get married. You better get married right away. He said, if you didn't get married and live together peacefully as husband and wife and make a good home for that little one there, he would throw you both in jail. And so on their way home, they stopped by the preacher's house and they got married. And since the widow baker had the reputation for being the best cook in the whole area, and since old man Williams had the reputation for being the absolutely best farmer in the area, and since neither one of them could understand a word the other one was saying, they lived happily ever after. Silly, silly, silly. (laughs) Sandy was the kind of man who was good with his hands. He measured twice and cut one. He never, ever started a job till he knew exactly how he was going to end it. Maybe you know some people like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. Now, Sandy, he has been held in bondage on a plantation in North Carolina, belonging to old man Thomas. It seemed to Sandy he was always being loaned out to people. Daddy, loan me Sandy. We want a new kitchen. Daddy, we need an extra bedroom. Send Sandy down to help with the work and be in charge of it. I want it to look real nice. It seemed to Sandy he was always traipsing around doing extra work usually for somebody in the Thomas family, but sometimes he'd get loaned out to friends, neighbors. He came back to the plantation after doing a great big job of work somewhere, and he went to the big house to tell Master Thomas that he was back. Master Thomas said, I'm sure you did a good job. Sandy said, I'd like to think so. And Sandy got real bold. He said, I'd like to have something for my work. And old man Thomas kind of chuckled, and he reached in his pocket for his change purse, and he said, well, that's fair. But Sandy said, I don't want your money. Well, what do you want? I want a wife. Old man Thomas looked at him for a minute. He said, that's good. A man should have a wife. Did you have somebody in mind? Now, Sandy had never, ever heard the expression, playing it close to your vest. But he understood the idea. And so he said, oh, there's plenty around the place that would do just fine. I noticed the other day old Dorcas's daughter... I don't remember her name. Old man Thomas said, her name's Teeny. Oh, Teeny, he said. Teeny'd do fine. Well, all right, said old man Thomas. She's your wife now. Now, Sandy could have gone straight to the quarters that night and taken Teeny if he'd wanted to. No one would have said him no. But Sandy was a wise man, and Sandy was a kind man. And so he went to old Dorcas, and he asked old Dorcas's permission to take Teeny walking. And old Dorcas said, it's after dark. What's Teeny going to be looking at in the dark? And Sandy said, I aim to show her what the moonlight looks like floating on the river. And so they went walking together. And they'd go walking together nearly every night. He brought her special things 
little pieces of meat, extra food of different kinds, made a chair for her. Before long, it's being told all over the plantation that they're going to get married, going to jump the broom together. And after that happened, they settled down as man and wife together. They were good to one another. And they were happy. Old Dorcas said, You think because you love one another, you belong to each other. Don't be forgetting. You belong to old man Thomas. Time went by. Now, the Thomas family, old man Thomas's wife, they'd had a big passel of girls, and their youngest child was the only boy they had. And I don't know if it was all those older sisters petting him when he was little, or if it was because his father never said no to him one day in his life. But young Mr. Thomas... He was a fool. He never met a deck of cards he didn't want to play with. He never met a bottle he didn't want to drain. He never met a skirt he didn't want to chase. As time went by, old man Thomas got sick and he died. And everybody held their breath. Because now everything belonged to young Master Thomas. It took him less than a year to run through everything his father had laid by in his lifetime. And then word come to the people in the quarters there was going to be a slave sale. Because young Master Thomas needed money, and he needed money fast. And the most expensive thing he owned was Sandy. Now word of a slave sale goes through the quarter like wildfire. And Sandy was in the fields when the word came to him, and he came running to his cabin. And when he saw Teeny's face, he knew she'd already heard the news. He dropped to his knees in front of her, and he buried his head in her lap, and he began to sob. And she stroked his hair, and she said, Don't cry. Don't cry. Something I never told you about me. I didn't want you to be afraid of me. You know I'm old Dorcas's daughter. Old Dorcas is a conjure woman. Old Dorcas taught me everything she knows. I just never told you because I didn't want you to. I didn't want to look in your eyes and see you being afraid of me. I could change you into something so you wouldn't be sold off the place. What you reckon you'd like to be changed into? You want to be some kind of animal? No, said Sandy, I don't want to be an animal. Something might happen to me. She said, you want to be a tree? Yeah, he said, I want to be a tree. Trees don't go anywhere. Make me a tree. And that night, in the dark of the moon, she took him by the hand and they went out and stood in the very edge of the yard of their cabin and she began to conjure and Teeny conjured and she conjured and she conjured. And when the light broke over the land the next morning, there was a big, tall pine tree standing in the corner of the yard that had never been there before. And people going to work in the fields go by it, and some of them would say, I don't remember that tree ever being there before. And the people with them would say, Well, you blind fool, it's been there all your life. People said it was strange that Sandy'd run off. The people in the big house said that he'd slipped away because he's being sold away. But the people in the quarters, they knew he wouldn't go off and leave Teeny. And it seemed so strange to them that he would leave her at all. They kept expecting him to come back and get her. But that never happened. And sometimes Teeny'd be looking out the window she saw a woodpecker come and light on that tree, and she heard it drumming on the trunk. She went out there and she threw a rock at that bird. In the dark of the moon that night, she went out and conjured Sandy back into the form of a man. 
brought him in the house. There's a wound on his shoulder from where that bird had pecked on that tree. And she treated it, bound it up for him. And by dawn the next morning, the tree was back where it belonged in the corner of the yard. Now because she was old Dorcas's daughter, Teeny knew a lot about tending to the sick. Poultices and potions, herbal remedies. And so when young Master Thomas's sister took sick and her husband came and asked for the loan of somebody to help take care of her, they sent for Teeny and she was gone for almost a month. And while she was gone from home, old man Thomas' wife told him that she was expecting a baby and that she had an idea about how she wanted things changed, that that room beside the bedroom they slept in where the servants had always slept, she wanted that room to be the nursery. And she wanted him to build another room off the kitchen where the servants would go and sleep now. And so he wanted to please her, and he was going to do that. He was riding out to supervise what was happening in the fields, and he rode by Teeny's cabin, and he noticed that pine tree. And the next day, he sent four men over there to fell that tree. They say that the first time the axe cut into that tree, it made a scream that sounded like a human voice. And that when that tree fell, what came out of the base of it wasn't sap. It was human blood. They trimmed it up and they put it on the wagon and they hauled it all the way over to the sawmill. Don't know if you've ever been at a sawmill. Any tree that's put to the blade will scream. It can be an unearthly sound. But the scream that came out of that tree when it was put to the blade was so frightening that two of the men who worked at the sawmill ran off around the hill and they never didn't come back to work ever. When the board lumber was cured, it was used to build that room Teeny came home, and all she saw in the corner of the yard was that stump. People began to talk about how she'd really gone down since Sandy left, since he run off. Seemed like she was out of her mind. Every time you'd go by her cabin, you'd see her out there walking around in the yard, sitting on that stump, talking to herself like she was talking to somebody. As time went by, the servants tried to sleep in that room that had been built beside the kitchen, but nobody could ever get a good night's sleep in that room. People would talk about the dreams they had when they slept in there, how fitful and hard the dreams were, how fitful their sleep was. How the nightmares had come in the middle of the night. How you felt haunted in that room. As time went by, young Miss Thomas, she got tired of having her husband come to her bed smelling of liquor and other women. And she locked the door on him. And he beat on it till his hands were raw. She wouldn't unlock the door. And he went downstairs and threw all the servants out of that new bedroom. Laid down to sleep in there. He must have had some awful dreams. So they found him the next morning hanging from the rafters in that room. Nobody could ever get a good night's sleep in that room. Well, except for Teeny.
That story was written by an African-American man named Charles Chestnut, and it appeared in the Atlantic magazine in 1889. I have adapted it for telling, which is a polite way of saying I messed with it. It had a very long and involved frame story that we didn't need at all. And it was written in very thick dialect that would be offensive if you had to listen to it today. Charles Chestnut wrote a lot of really interesting stories. He was a part of a great flowering of African-American literature that happened in the 1880s and the 1890s. If you go to your computer, you can probably find some stories by Charles Chestnut. Two T's. Okay. Not in Charles, in Chestnut. <laughs> Honestly. I was sitting in a booth in Columbus, Mississippi at a Denny's with my old friend Betsy Bishop. If you ever get homesick when you're out on the road, go to Denny's. They all look alike. Even the waitresses look alike. You can pretend that you were anywhere if you're at Denny's. And Betsy said, we've been to everything that's listed on their tourist brochure except their old cemetery it's historic and I said it seems a shame to leave Columbus Mississippi without going to everything that's listed on their brochure after all they printed it in color <laughs> and so we went to the cemetery it was an old cemetery you could tell right off that it had been made for the dead not for the living we don't do that anymore, do we? If your loved one died tonight and you wanted to honor them and you bought a marker, you'd have to put it, a marker in the ground for the convenience of the person, living person who's going to mow. We think a lot more about the living now than we do about the dead. But this cemetery was so old you could tell it was intended for dead people. There weren't restrictions on what you could put on a loved one's grave. People had, since the late part of the 1700s, erected monuments. Oh, there were the usual depictions of Jesus. There were divans and chairs. There was curtaining, all made out of marble or granite. But what caught my eye were the angels. They were everywhere you looked. There were angels kneeling and angels sitting. There were angels singing. There were angels playing the harp. There were angels playing the trumpet. There were angels playing the drum. Who knew heaven had a percussion section? There were angels flying, angels ascending. There were cherubim and seraphim falling down before him. Everywhere you looked. And Betsy said, you choose an angel to be your angel and I'll choose an angel to be my angel. We do that kind of thing. We walked for a while through the cemetery and after a while Betsy said, that's my angel. It was a small angel sitting on the ground feeding a lamb, looked just like Betsy. The angel, not the lamb. <laughs> she said, which one's yours? I said, I haven't seen it yet. And we walked further back through the cemetery. I thought we were coming pretty close to the end of the cemetery because we've been walking a long way. And then I spotted her. I'd never seen anything like her before. It was a family plot. The family's name, Teasdale, like the American poet, but not her family. And like a lot of southern cemeteries, that family plot was surrounded by a little white picket fence. I've never decided if that's to 
hold the dead in or to keep the living out. But you see that in the South sometimes. And we were in Mississippi. But in the middle of that plot was an angel unlike any I had ever seen before. She had thrown herself on the grave, prostrate in her grief. It almost looked like her marble shoulders were shaking in sobs. My mother had only been dead a few months. I said, that's my angel. Betsy said, looks just like you. I raised my eyes from that angel and looked toward the right. And saw that we weren't anywhere near close to the end of the cemetery. That there were rows and rows of tombstones that stretched out in front of us. But they didn't look like any of the tombstones we had just passed. These stones were exactly alike. And they marched in military rows across the brow of the hill. Even the same inscription on every stone. Unknown Confederate soldier, 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 until they disappeared out of sight. I looked to the left. More tombstones. These, the traditional domed shape. And they too marched in precise rows all the way over the crest of the hill with the same inscription, unknown union dead, 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 unknown union dead. dead. And just then, the man who was the caretaker for the cemetery came tootling up in a little cart. And he wanted to know if we'd found the grave we were looking for because he was sure we were there on some kind of genealogy project. And we told him we weren't looking for any grave in particular, that we just liked to come to graveyards. And he gave us such a look. (laughs) And he followed my gaze and he said, Stunning, isn't it? I said, yes. Where did they come from? He said, well, you're standing in Mississippi, but they came from Shiloh. Shiloh's just three stops down the train track. People think about the bloody battles of the Civil War. They often think about Gettysburg first. But more men fell at Shiloh than fell in every war America had fought up to that date. In two days, more men fell at that battle than had died in every war that we had fought to that time. Takes your breath away. I said, how many of them are there? He said, 55 acres. The men with names were buried at the first two stops. 55 acres of graves without. It cut into my heart. He said, this is my retirement job. It's harder than I thought it was going to be. I'm tired at the end of the day every day now that I'm in my 70s. And every day I can't wait to go home and flop down in my recliner chair and drink me a beer. I always try to stay up long enough to watch the news. Scares me. I watch the news and then I come here and look at these graves, all 55 acres. And I wonder if it could ever come to that again here in the United States. Could American blood ever be shed by other Americans here on American soil? When I watch the news, it scares me. We can't even talk to one another anymore. We can't be polite to somebody else who has a different opinion than we do. Could it come to that again? You know, if you go online, everything's got a website. There's even a website for Memorial Day, he said. 
And if you look at that website, you will see that they tell you that Memorial Day was started by some fancy Union general that decided there should be a day in honor of the men who died fighting for the Union. I think it was 1870 or something. But you know, before the war was even over, the women here in Columbus, Mississippi, began decorating the graves of the glorious Confederate dead. Nobody remembers the name of the woman who first said, but what about those poor boys over there? Their mothers are so far away. And so the women of Columbus, Mississippi, went back to their gardens and they began to cut more flowers. They brought them by the wagon load. And they didn't stop until they had decorated every grave. He said, don't you think it's remarkable that they would decorate the graves of the men who might have caused the death of their husbands and fathers and brothers and sons? I think that's remarkable. They can talk all they want about how that Union General started Memorial Day, but we know it started here in Columbus, Mississippi, before the war was even over. The women of Columbus started Memorial Day. It, if it ever comes to American blood being shed on American soil by other Americans, all I pray for is that when it's all over, there'll be some woman who will step forward and say, but what about those poor boys? Their mothers are so far away. I made the thousand mile trip from my driveway in Dallas to the home place in Kentucky. Came off the Cumberland Parkway, made that hard left there at Linden, the spot where my children call leaving civilization. Because <laughs> when you make that hard left turn, your cell phone goes completely black. My mother and my dear Aunt Ruth had already crossed over Jordan. Nobody left at the home place but my Aunt Louise. She's still alive. My doctor said meanness is a preservative. <laughs> and that meant that Aunt Louise might last forever. She was what Kentucky people call a caution to the wildcats. And it was Christmas. I needed to go and be at the home place with Aunt Louise because I needed to give the caregivers some days off. If they didn't get some time off at Christmas, they might just up and quit. And what would I do then? So even though there were a lot of places I would rather, even though I would rather be any place, other than with Aunt Louise for Christmas. That's where I was headed. And by now she was getting really frail and she was bedridden. Not too feeble to be absolutely miserable to other people. Still as mean as a striped snake. But bedridden. And that meant that when I arrived... I wouldn't be able to leave again for three or four days because I wouldn't be able to leave her by herself. I knew that the main caregiver, Betty, would be standing on the front porch watching for my car. And that as soon as she saw me pull into the driveway, she would run to her car and leave and I wouldn't see her for three or four days. So I figured if I wanted to do any visiting, I should do it before I went on to the home place. I stopped at Uncle Mike and Aunt Margie's. And I told Uncle Mike and Aunt Margie that I was going to fix Christmas dinner for me and Aunt Louise and that 
if Uncle Mike wanted me to, I'd make Christmas dinner for him and Aunt Margie too. He said he never had cared much for turkey. Aunt Margie said, shut up. <laughs> and I, thinking that the store was still open, I said, if you could have anything you wanted for Christmas, Uncle Mike, what would you have? And he said, well, young, and if I could have anything I wanted, I'd have fried squirrel and squirrel gravy and biscuits. And Aunt Margie said, shut up. And I got in my car and went on up to the home place. Because they don't sell that at the store, even in Boonville. I was wrong about Betty. She wasn't standing on the porch waiting for me. She was standing beside her car. <laughs> and she threw gravel all over me getting out of the driveway. And I went in the house. And I'd been in there about long enough to be thinking about killing Aunt Louise. Fifteen minutes, maybe twenty. When there was a knock at the door, and when I went to answer it, I was as surprised to see Alfred Harrell standing there as he was surprised to see me. When I was a little girl, Alfred Harrell was always my brother Tom's closest friend. And whatever the two of them were up to, I was always on the receiving end of it. So to tell you the God's honest truth, I've never had much use for Alfred Harrell. But there he was. He said, I want to talk to your brother. I said, Tom's not here. He said, no, I want to talk to your brother. I said, Tom's not here. He said, oh, come on. I need to talk to Tom. I said, Tom's not here. Big as he is, I think I would have noticed. He said, pickup truck, Texas plates, I want to talk to Tom. I said, my pickup truck, my Texas plates, Tom's not here. And then thinking it was Christmas and that I should think about the season, I said, thinking I would take a message to my brother when I got back to Texas, I said, and if Tom had been here, what would you have said to him? And he said, well, if your brother had been here, I would have asked for the loan of $20. The Mid-South plant burned to the ground. I said, I saw it as I came by. That must be awful hard on people. So many people up here in our end of the county make that 55-mile drive back and forth every day, tickled in their hearts to have a job working at the Mid-South plant. And when I came by, Alfred, I saw it burn to the ground. There wasn't one brick standing on another one. That meant mean hard times for people. He said, you just don't know hard times. I said, so if Tom had been here, you'd have asked for $20. He said, yeah, you remember my daughter, Becky. I said, sure, I remember Becky real good. He said, she'd been living in Cincinnati. She came home. We weren't expecting her. She's a good mama. She had presents for the baby, but she couldn't bring them. And if I had $20, I could go to the dollar store and buy Christmas for the baby. You can buy a good Christmas at the dollar store for $20. I was raised there. I know the baby doesn't mean an infant. That's just the youngest child in the family. That child could be old enough to know it's Christmas. And so I went to the kitchen and I got a 20 out of my wallet and I came back and I said, Alfred, wouldn't you rather earn this 20 than be beholden to give it back to me? And he said, sure, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to go right up there to the head of the holler and I want you to kill me two good fat red squirrels. He said, you give me $20 for two fat red squirrels? I said, sure. He said, you've been living in the city a long time. <laughs> I said, I would give you $5 more if you'd skin them out for me. He said, I'd like to help you, but I can't. Why not? He said, well, that land up there, that belongs to your aunt. Nobody can go up there and hunt. Nobody's been up there to hunt in years. Well, Mike Moore went up there about five years ago. He spent seven days in jail over it. I can't go up there. It's too close to Christmas. I can't go to jail. 
I said, Alfred, you know, the truth is half of that land always belonged to my mama. And while my mama was living, she wouldn't say suey to a goose. So whatever Aunt Louise said, it was always that way. Mama's dead now. He said, yeah, I saw you at the funeral. I said, I saw you too, Alfred. Thanks for coming. Now that Mama's dead, half that land belongs to me. I figure Aunt Louise's park runs right along the ridge there, and there's probably nothing up there but skunks and polecats. But I'm just sure that on my part, they're good, fat red squirrels. He said, well, if I won't go to jail over it, I'll get you some squirrels. And he started down the sidewalk. And then I had an idea, and I called out to him, Alfred, he turned back. I said, while you're up there, it's Christmas. Why don't you take a turkey? Well, all right, he said, a turkey. And he walked a little way, and then he turned, and he looked back at me. He said, you remember my brother Roscoe? I said, sure, I remember Roscoe real good. He said, Roscoe worked at the Mid-South plant, too. Could Roscoe have a turkey? I said, you tell your brother Roscoe that Elizabeth said he can come here and take a deer. Roscoe gets a deer. <laughs> and I get a turkey. I said, who do you think always came back and untied me? And he had the good grace to laugh, too. I gave Aunt Louise a good bath. I put the new flannel pajamas on her I bought her for Christmas. I fixed her something nice to eat. I was sitting there talking to her while she's eating, and I noticed how hard it was for her. I thought, I believe that she's getting worn out before she gets full. When you're 97, eating's a struggle. And I made a note to myself to remind Betty to try to help Aunt Louise by giving her bites in between her attempt to get them in her mouth. And I started doing that myself. Want some banana pudding? It's good. When there was a knock on the door, and when I went to answer it, I wasn't at all surprised to see Alfred Harold there that time. He had shot me three good red squirrels. He'd even cut them up for me and put them to soak in salt water. And it had been so long since I'd cooked a squirrel, I didn't have any idea if I would have remembered that part at all. It takes the gamey taste out. I said, Alfred, I've been thinking about this ever since you were here. I heard what you said with my woman's ears. He said, what does that mean? I said, you, tell, you told me Becky came home and you weren't expecting her. She had presents for the baby and she couldn't bring them. When does Becky go back? He stuck his chin out at me and he said, I ain't letting her go back. I said, how bad did he hurt her? He said, bad enough. I'm going to kill him, but I have to wait till my check comes. I said, I've been thinking about this ever since you were gone. How many people do you think there were that worked at the Mid-South plant that lived up here in our end of the county? He said, counting me and Roscoe, probably a dozen. I said, I want you to call every one of those men for me. And tell him that Elizabeth Ellis said to come here and take a deer off her land. He said, well, I could go hunting for each one of them and kill them a deer. I said, I don't want it done that way. And he stepped back and he looked at me for a minute and he said, a man should put food on his own table. I said, that would be good. Now, I don't want people going on my land to hunt that I don't even know. So you're going to have to go with every single one of them when they go to hunt. All right, he said, I could do that. I said, you are Roscoe. 
Have you got a place to butcher, Alfred? He said, well, yeah, across the road at Mama's house. I said, would your mama be willing to let all these people come and butcher there? He said, well, Lord, yes, she'd be glad to have the company. I said, good, a lot of them are going to live in trailers. They won't have a place to butcher. What I want you to do for me is tell every single one of them that as soon as they finish the butchering, they have to give half the meat away and keep the other half. He said, well, who would they give it to? I said, I don't care, as long as it's somebody that needs the meat. Old people like Uncle Mac and Aunt Margie that can't hunt for themselves anymore. Some woman that's got a house full of children and no man to help her put food on the table. Doesn't really matter to me. Maybe people who worked at Mid-South that live somewhere else that I don't even know, that don't live in our end of the county. As long as they need the meat, it doesn't matter. He said, let me see if I got this straight. i got to call every man who worked at the Mid-South plant with me. Tell them to come and take a deer, go hunting with them, and help them with the butchering. And tell them they got to live half the meat away, give it to somebody that needs it. I said, that's right. He said, you mean like they could give it to somebody that used to go off and leave them tied up to the trunk of a tree? I said, right, Alfred. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I want to thank the Portland Storytelling Guild and Barbara in particular for letting us be together tonight. I want to thank Pearl Steinberg who hosted me for a big part of this week and my new friends over here, Mary and Vern, who hosted me the rest of the week. I'm going home tomorrow. I've been out on the road. Uh, well, I was home one night to wash clothes. Since the beginning of November, I've been home one night. And I have to go home because I'm out of clean socks. I've had a lovely time here in Oregon. I got to go to Bend and to Eugene and then to come here, and it was lovely. You live in an awful pretty place among really good-hearted people. Thanks for coming to hear me tonight. I really appreciate it.